Hello and welcome to the Radiology Scholar Certificate Program. My name is Benjamin Highland. I'm a fourth year medical student at Wake Forest School of Medicine. And I'm gonna be talking to you today about radiology pathology correlation, specifically focusing on invasive ductal carcinoma. So this discussion is gonna be framed around an interesting case presentation. The case is a 71 year old black man whose chief complaint is a left breast mass. He has a medical history of AFib, uh, uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia, anxiety, diabetes, coronary artery disease, hypertension, uh, an aortic valve replacement, as well as hyperlipidemia. His labs, more or less unremarkable. So we're gonna get some imaging studies on him, namely a bilateral diagnostic mammogram and a left breast ultrasound, just to kind of take a closer look at that left breast mass. So let's jump just directly into the imaging. Let's look first at the, the mammogram. So it is, uh, you can see, uh, just some, some moderate gynecomastia, uh, which you, you can see here in just the density of this tissue. And there's also kind of, as you can see right, right in there, this lobulated equal density mass with kind of partially uh, circumscribed and partially obscured margins. If we move over to the left breast uh, ultrasound, there is this corresponding hypoechoic oval mass, uh, again, with kind of indistinct margins, but with some posterior um, enhancement as well. So what conclusions can we draw from this? Well, there is a suspicious left breast mass without any axillary lymphadenopathy. The breast tissue is kind of heterogeneously dense. And then we can also talk a little bit about the BIRADS categorization. So this is a categorized as a BIRADS 4, which means a suspicious abnormality. Uh, not really sure what's going on. So we're going to do a biopsy would be the recommendation here for BIRADS. So this brings us to our first learning point here. What is BIRADS? BIRADS is a assessment categorization system for breast radiology. The uh, categor categories range from really a score of zero to six, zero being an incomplete uh, imaging study, um, one through three, three being negative or benign most likely. And the recommendations there are just gonna be continue annual screening, or if it's just probably benign, you might um, increase the interval. Uh, so it might be something more like six months instead of longer than that. And then four, which is what we saw in our case here is some sort of lesion that is suspicious for malignancy. And in this case, kind of depending on some uh, subclasses, you have 4A, 4B, 4C over there that kind of further um, classify the degree of suspicion for, for malignancy. But in any case, we, we may end up recommending a biopsy here. This can be kind of contrasted with the, the five and six categories, highly suggestive malignancy or biopsy proven malignancy where you're, you're gonna get a biopsy if that's gonna be required, um, or there's already been a biopsy that has confirmed this. Before we get that biopsy though, we, we can think a little bit about a differential diagnosis. So what could this lesion be? It could be a breast abscess, it could be a breast cyst, some just fibrocystic changes, it could be fat necrosis, or it could be something uh, a little bit more serious than that. It could be a type of malignancy, it could be LCIS, DCIS, some sort of invasive carcinoma, or something a little bit less serious, maybe like a fibroadenoma or a phyllodes tumor. But to get to the bottom of that differential diagnosis, this is where pathology becomes very useful. So we're gonna do our biopsy and we're gonna send that to pathology for their final diagnosis. And one of the nice things about pathology is that we're now exiting a world that's just in black and white, and we're now entering a, a much more colorful space. So before we jump right into the details of pathology though, let's talk a little bit about just normal breast anatomy. So the breast is gonna be composed of 15 to 25 different uh, lobes that are gonna be connected by a, a branching duct system. Each lobe is gonna be made of about 20 to 40 lobules and the lobules are gonna contain multiple terminal duct lobular units, which are the functional site of milk production. Histologically speaking, we're gonna be looking at a glandular epithelium that's gonna have kind of varying shapes and a few different cell types. So the shape uh, is, gonna, is gonna be either columnar in the collecting ducts and will kind of gradually decrease in size and become more cuboidal in the asini. And then the cell types, there's gonna be the secretory kind of luminal um, epithelial cells that we see kind of right in here, but there are also gonna be these myelopithelial cells that are kind of uh, surrounding uh, those, those epithelial cells and helping to push out any proteinaceous material that is, that is produced here. 
So here's an example of that breast anatomy and histology that we just went over. So we have our lobe elements, our lobule elements, and our asini elements that we're now going to go into in some more detail. So if we look at the elements of the lobe, we see that there is there are several lobules here in the lobe. There are blood vessels, there are ducts, adipose tissue, and some stroma. If we zoom in on one of those lobules, we'll see kind of some lobular elements. So again, there's some adipose tissue. Again, there is this duct. But we can now see more clearly the asini. Uh, so let's zoom in on that. Taking a closer look at this, these asini, we can see that there are these glandular epithelial cells right in here that are secreting this pink proteinaceous material into their lumen. And we can also see that there are these myelopithelial cells, kind of this thin ink line around here, that is lining that gland and again helping to push out that proteinaceous material. Now that we understand the basic elements of uh, normal breast histology, we can start to talk about the spectrum of disease that can happen. So in terms of ductal carcinoma, there's really a spectrum between usual ductal hyperplasia, atypical ductal hyperplasia, DCIS, and invasive ductal carcinoma. Usual ductal hyperplasia is just a uh, proliferation of benign secretary and myoepithelial cells. So you can see here that this layer is becoming a little bit a little bit more thick, but we're still preserving these, this layer of myoepithelial cells. And for that reason, there's going to be strong CK56 positivity, which is a stain that can be used uh, to identify those myoepithelial cells. Compare this to atypical ductal hyperplasia. And again, we're going to see an intact layer of myoepithelial cells, which you can kind of see right around here. We're going to see jumbled glandular cells that are not polarizing clearly around a lumen. And this time we're going to see a slightly weaker CK56 positivity. It could still be there, but it's not going to be as strong. An important thing to mention here about uh, ADH is that it can be difficult to differentiate from a low-grade DCIS, ductal carcinoma, in situ, and that there's going to be a lot of inter-observer variability, and for that reason, the diagnosis can be a little bit controversial. This brings us naturally to a discussion of the DCIS. So the major distinction that can be made between ADH and DCIS is based on size, so if it's greater than 2 millimeters, the lesion, and space involvement, so if it's involving greater than two spaces, or if it's only a portion of those spaces. DCIS does also have some other features. So now instead of myelopathial cells being present, present on the outside and kind of intermixed within those glandular cells, we're really only going to expect to see an intact layer of myelopathial cells on the, the outside. And for this reason, there's going to be negative CK56 staining. We're also going to see a little bit more uniformity in the nuclei, especially if it's low grade, which we wouldn't necessarily expect to see in usual ductal hyperplasia or atypical ductal hyperplasia, as you would expect to see a little bit more variation in nuclear size there. And maybe most impressively, we're going to start to see a little bit more polarization of these cells around the, the lumen. So now you can kind of see that they are lining up a little bit more. In higher grade lesions, we're also going to see some, some commutonecrosis as well, would be possible. So now we can speak a little bit about invasive ductal carcinoma, particularly invasive ductal carcinoma of no special type, uh, which is important because there are several different, different types of invasive ductal carcinoma that could change the discussion a little bit. So what are the features, broadly speaking, of invasive ductal carcinoma? Well, generally speaking, we now have a lesion uh, in which the cells have invaded past the capsule and into the stroma. So we're now seeing this infiltrative pattern. We see these glands just intermixed in the stroma here. We see some desmoplastic change surrounding them, uh, kind of this, this bluish discoloration around the, the glands. The tubules are going to be a little bit more angulated. There's going to be um, some more large pleomorphic nuclei, which we can't really appreciate from this magnification. And there could be also some, some necrosis and some increased mitoses as well. And when it comes to grading invasive ductal carcinoma, we're going to use the Nottingham criteria. So that's going to be based upon tubule formation, nuclear pleomorphism, mitotic count, and we're going to rank each of those three categories uh, with points ranging from one to three. So the final score is going to come out from three to nine, and based on that, we're going to determine a grade. So talking a little bit about tubule formation, if greater than 75% of the lesion is still forming tubules, then we're going to say that's one point. 
if it's less than 10% of the lesion is forming tubules. So in other words, we're forming sheets kind of like this, and the, the, the cells are not organizing themselves into tubules. That will be a three. If we're somewhere in the middle, that'll be a, a two. Nuclear pleomorphism, again, is difficult to, to appreciate from this magnification. But generally speaking, the, the larger and more variation uh, in the in nuclear pleomorphism nuclei is going to correspond to a, a higher uh, grade here. And then the mitotic count, it's going to depend a little bit on microscope field. And again, hard to see here, but generally speaking, the more mitoses that we see, the, the worse the grade is going to be. So just to kind of sum everything up, a three to a five is going to be grade one, 67 is going to be a grade two, and eight to nine is going to be a grade three. So from the point of view of radiologists, we now, I think, have a better understanding of what happens after biopsy and how the final diagnosis is going to be made. In this case, uh, our 71-year-old man did end up having invasive ductal carcinoma uh, with mucinous features, which we didn't really get into too much, and a grade of one out of three. So we know that the final diagnosis of invasive ductal carcinoma can't be made without pathology, but as a radiologist, what could we see on our imaging that might lead us in that direction. So here we're looking at an ultrasound guided biopsy uh, with clip placement that was performed on that same patient. So we see the clip placed here, kind of right in the middle of that lesion that we identified earlier. So the radiographic features on mammography, it's gonna, we're gonna see kind of an irregular mass with or without calcifications. It could be spiculated and hyperdense. It might be circumscribed, which would be more common in a, in a grade three lesion. Um, and there may also be some microcalcifications. On ultrasound, we're going to see this ill-defined hypoechoic mass with hyperechoic angular margins. And there could be some posterior acoustic shadowing, which would be more likely in grade one, or some posterior enhancement, like we saw in this case, which would be more likely in a grade three, although our patient did end up having a grade one lesion. We'll also see um, ductal extension, possibly, which would represent extension of the mass into the surrounding parenchyma, as well as branch or a speculated pattern, and again, possibly some micro calcifications on ultrasound. So let's do a quick overview. Invasive ductal carcinoma typically is going to present as a large palpable immobile mass. From a radiology standpoint, the workup is going to be mammography and ultrasound. Talking about treatment a little bit, this is going to be um, really a multifactorial decision. It's gonna depend on uh, the wishes of the surgeon as well as the wishes of the patient and just everybody kind of coming together to make the best decision for the patient. But generally speaking, we may do some sort of surgical uh, excision that could be a lumpectomy to conserve some more breast tissue or it could be a mastectomy with or without axillary lymph node dissection. We may also offer some local radiotherapy to reduce the risk of recurrence as well as kind of adjuvant or neoadjuvant systemic chemotherapy. We may also use some more targeted therapies such as anti-HER2. Selection of this treatment, again, is going to be very, uh, it's going to be dependent on a lot of factors. The prognosis of invasive ductal carcinoma is going to be based on the Nottingham Prognostic Index, which uh, I would like to distinguish here from the grading criteria that we discussed before. So the um, Nottingham criteria we discussed before really is just the grade of the tumor, the one through three here. And then that's going to feed into this kind of larger prognostic index that um, will depend on the size of the lesion, lesion in centimeters, the number of nodes involved, greater than three, zero, um, is going to interpret, is going to change that, that score here. So once we get our MPI or Nottingham prognostic index, we're going to interpret that number uh, as is here. So let's say your MPI is greater than 5.4, that's going to be a poor prognosis and only 44% uh, chance in this case of a 10-year survival, as opposed to an MPI of less than 2.4, which is going to be really an excellent prognosis and 96% of the time you're going to have at least 10-year survival. So that brings us to the end of our discussion of the correlation between radiology pathology concerning invasive ductal carcinoma. Thank you so much for watching this video, which was produced by the Radiology Scholar Certificate Program at Wake Forest School of Medicine. I hope you all have a great day.